Welcome to Roundtable 2. Uh, we hope you're having a wonderful day. Today's roundtable is entitled Space Map Go System Design, Designing for Different Rooms. And so we're going to take some of the concepts that we talked about last week and expand upon them. With me today, my primary panelists are Bob McCarthy, Director of System Optimization. Then we have Yanina Canales, Application Architect and Spatial Audio Specialist for Meyer Sound, as well as Jose Gaudin, Technical Support Specialist. And my name is Josh Furman, and I'm also a Technical Support Specialist for Meyer Sound. Today's topics, well, first we're gonna talk about who can use Space Map Go. And uh, we also are gonna review the system design guidelines that Bob introduced last week, just a short, short little refresher. And then we're gonna take those guidelines and those concepts behind them and expand beyond just this theoretical square room. So let's talk real quick about what Space Map Go is and who it's for. And last week, we talked about this rumor that our competitors are putting out that you need a lot of speakers to use Space Map Go. And as we showed last week, you only need two speakers. Uh, you can use Space Map Go, and a Space Map is a visual representation of any loudspeaker layout. Since you can use Space Map Go with any loudspeaker layout, you can use Space Map and bring immersion and immersive audio to almost any platform. Space Map Go specifically, the application was designed to be a live mixing platform. And uh, we can see here up at the top right, we have a standard console, and then right next to that console is an iPad. And so this allows the user to quickly mix and move sound around the space and also pre program their show if they need to. And since Space Map Go is client server based, you can actually build an, a mixer out of multiple iPads. We've seen it to where people have three iPads set up with different views, and they actually mix live shows and move sound around in the space. This is very popular in EDM right now. The use case of Space Map Go goes far beyond traditional live music. It's also great for theater and theatrical environments. Recently, we deployed Space Map Go and used it as an audience replication system at a big university football stadium. And we used Space Map Go to make it sound like 100,000 college students were in the audience. The head of audio at that stadium said it sounded just like game day. The possibilities of Space Map Go are endless. Again, if you just have two loudspeakers, you can still use Space Map Go and use it as a panner, but also use it as a leveler. If you have more speakers, then great. It works with any loudspeaker layout. And what we're talking about today is the system design aspect of any system design for immersive audio. And so we're talking about the physics and the things that are needed to do that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bob McCarthy, uh, Director of System Optimization for Meyer Sound. Bob, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, take it away. We are going to continue moving uh, forward from where we started on the seminar last week. And um, if you haven't seen last week's, it's been uploaded and you can look at that. But we're going to take a, just a few moments here and review the six design steps for a space map go design. And this is for a, a 360 degrees horizontal and an overhead. And I call it the sonic planetarium. You can move a helicopter around the side of the place and you can fly it in circles above you. That's the basic idea. And of course, as we know with space map, that means you can fly 32 helicopters all going with different trajectories um, at the same time all through that space. So the six steps are we have to define the room, the coverage perimeter, um, the go factor, the G, and the go zone. Go zone is the is an area that's it near the center of things, and that's what we're going to use as a marking point for some of the critical design decisions, <clears throat> such as the um, horizontal spacing, the vertical um, height, and these kind of things. We're going to start with the main system and define its horizontal spacing, height, and aim. When we go to the laterals, that includes uh, side surrounds and rear surrounds. Then we go to the overhead to complete the vertical part of the planetarium. We've got to figure out their spacing, their aim, and their height. Uh, then we can add the low frequency and then assign the processing channels. Assigning processing channels is pretty easy. Everybody gets one. Very briefly to review this step one, this is our square room that we worked on last time. It was a 20 by 20 meter speaker perimeter. That means even though it was a 22 by 22 meter uh, room, the speakers needed a little uh, room to be mounted on the walls. And so we were left with 20 meters of internal 
that gave us a go zone of 10 meters by 10 meters and a G or go factor of five meters. The G is one fourth of the skinniest side of things is the basic definition of G. Okay, in square and rectangular rooms, that's going to be the story. So in this particular case, we end up with the five meter G. So we space the mains and we put them one G apart. Um, if you were going to go with three mains, so you'd have a left center and a right, and they occupy the width of the go zone, which is two G's. And so you see them spread across two G's. If it was four speakers, you would fill up that same space. And if it's five speakers, you still fill up that same space. You just keep going and tighten up spacing. Now, the aiming horizontally is everybody goes through the center of the go zone. And so everybody aims through there. And the aim point of the end of them is the opposite side, the last listener on the far side. Of course, if you have an array of speakers as your main, your goal, of course, is uniform coverage from front to back. I'm pointing, telling you about how you would aim a single speaker. If it's an array, well, then it's, it's aimed for maximum front to back uniformity because the whole idea is that each one of these main systems is intended to cover the whole room. What we want to do now is figure out the height, and the height is a minimum of one half G. If you're less than a half G, essentially, you're just not going to make it. You're going to be like a front fill. You're just too low. Um, by the time you get up to one G, that is a, a puts you in a position where you can cover a larger amount of the room and get quite deep. And three quarters of a G is a compromise in between. The thing about one G is it puts you at 45 degrees to listeners that are on the edge of the go zone perimeter and anything above 45 degrees is going to be considered in our brain um, to be an overhead source we're going to call the break point for a lateral source is below 45 so that's what we call 1g the top limit for your laterals whereas they aim well they're aiming like i said before at the complete uh, far end of the hall the opposite side the rear surrounds are going to be spaced just like the mains were. They're going to be spaced 1G apart. And in our particular application, I'm going to put them at a height of 1G. The side surrounds are also 1G apart, but you'll notice they're staggered off of the center. So they're a half G forward of the zone. Then it's 1G spacing from there. So this guy is centered on the go zone. And that's for a simple symmetric room, the math falls out. When the math falls out a little funny, like if you shaved a meter off of this, well, then you're going to respace these guys slightly to accommodate that slight reduction. You would knock a few percent off of there, an appropriate scaling factor. So this is the idea that everybody covers the whole room. You can see there's a rear surround, two different rear surrounds. They cover everybody. So the idea is you want to have decorrelated sources. You can't be putting the same material in both of them. Um, that's what Space Map Go is for. It will sort out and make directional that single channel so that it moves with you. Now we're going to move to the overhead. The overhead, and uh, I like to space things at uh, 2G height. At a 2G height, you get a really good ability to cover large amounts of the room. And you use the same height and spacing. So if I'm 2G's height, I'm going to use 2G spacing. And so the lowest that's really workable at all is a 1G height, and you're going to get a real spotty coverage. And anything less than 1G, you are certainly to become just an overhead source in the global sense. You're not going to be able to map things and move things around. In other words, a helicopter raises up, but it sits there static in the room. It doesn't fly around the room overhead. It stays just overhead. Okay, so there's my spacing. And now I'm going to add low frequencies. Low frequencies are, of course, are going to be fewer elements, and we can space them further apart. They are uh, intended to create a decorrelated source, and they get linked, which Josh would explain to you about making them be a derived node, linking them to the local speakers so that as we move the sound around, anything in this general direction, uh, southwest, turns up this, I'm sorry, southeast turns on that one and northeast turns on this and northwest would turn on that one. Um, then we're going to do signal processing. Essentially, like I said before, you're going to have everybody gets a channel. So that's the review. I try to make that as quick as possible. And now we're going to 
rescale things. We can go to any scale that we want. If you make this room bigger, but keep it a square, everything essentially stays in the same place. You just need more powerful speakers, but all of the angles and the aims and the relative heights in G factor, those are all going to scale the same. But all rooms are not squares. They don't have a flat floor and a single level. So let's start to look at some of the other shapes available. So the first thing we want to do is take our square. This is the same square that we've been using, 10 meters uh, go zone, 20 meter rectangle. And we're going to turn it into a 25 by 20, 20 meters. So we stretched it a little bit um, to the right, just going back. We're just stretching this one direction. So what did we have to do? Well, what we did was we added one more lateral. Since the go spacing was five meters, when we added five meters of room, what did we need to do? We needed to add five meters of laterals. That means one of these guys. If we had added four meters of room, we would still have to add another speaker, but then we would squeeze each of the guys in by a quarter meter or so, and they would end up with a 4.75 spacing. Basically, when things come out on odd numbers, unless it's really just, you know, if it's barely like, you know, you only need a tenth of a speaker more, yeah, sure. But if it's looking like I could benefit from adding another speaker, more immersion is better than less. So you can round upward overall. So there we are. We've ended up with this same spacing as we've increased it. The go zone increased by five meters as well. It added five meters in this direction. So one thing to note is that it's a five meter change in both of these dimensions. It's a 25% increase in the room, but it's a 50% increase in the go zone. So this has become more asymmetric than this. It's a a one and a half to one ratio as opposed to a five to four ratio, three to two versus five to four, if you think in terms of ratios. So what about on our overheads? Well, we're going to need six overheads, whereas before we needed just four. Why do we need six? Because we've added this extra room. And so now I've got a little rounding error. I don't need a full 2G spacing that would put it too close to here, but you're ending up at one and three quarters type of spacing. But I'm going to fill it up with six evenly spaced. You see, I move this off of the corner. I like to work this so that these are as evenly spaced as possible. So I'll work these until geometrically I get the most even spacing because that's going to make the space map move around the, the, the most intuitive and easy to move space map trajectories. Let's do bear in mind, Josh will tell you, I could screw this up and he could still make the trajectory work. But let's just make it easier by putting the physics in your favor. Physics say that if you have a even distribution of speakers, then um, it's that much easier for the math to make the transitions and for the ear to be better fooled that you are just having a seamless movement. When you push this guy over and put him to there, it'll stretch this out and it'll contract that. But you're, it's still going to be easier for your brain if that thing is there. Just think of it as the time on the clock. So let's stretch this room a little more. Now I've stretched it to a 30 by 20. It's a three to two ratio in the room, and it's a two to one ratio in the go zone rectangle. So now I'm going to, again, for my overheads, we'll just pick up right where we left. I'm back to the overheads, and I'm back to a full 2G spacing. So if I go back two things, you see there's my spacing, 10 meter spacing, which is 2Gs, and now I'm still a 10 meter spacing. I'm right on all of the, the corners, and there you go. So you've got two G's this way, two G's that way, two G's this way. And so we've got essentially an oblong rectangulated trajectory for the overheads. We've had to add yet another lateral on the sides. Why? Because we added five more meters of room. That means we need five more meters of surround. You'll notice, though, we start, we're still ending up aimed in the same place. Everybody is coming to the center. The center has moved, but we're all aimed at the center. So everybody re-aims, and your verticals are going to get re-aimed as well. The room ended 10 meters earlier before. So the mains have had to angle up to go deep all the way to the back. 
these guys didn't change much because the room is the same width, but this guy has a lot more diagonal. So what you see now as this diverges, uh, the aspect ratio gets higher than the differential between what a lateral in the center sees and a lateral in the corner sees gets larger. And so you'll start to see these differentiate by a couple of degrees. You'll also note that the shape, the ideal shape for this speaker is definitely a speaker that's much wider than deep, as whereas this guy coming this way doesn't need to be as wide because look at its shape. It's got a very different shape. The, the, this guy sees three to two and two to three. So, so Bob, <clears throat> as you spread out, as you your building gets wider, your room gets wider, chances are on your laterals, you're going to have to angle up your speakers to get yes. a longer throw. Uh, and also your symmetry of speakers going from a square to a rectangle, chances are when you're on the odd ends, you're going to have to have a uh, longer throw speaker with a narrower coverage. That That is to your advantage. This, in our case, like an X40, which is 110 by 40, is a great choice here because it's going to go wide. And here, you might be able to use the the 70 degree speaker, not maybe yet, yet, but when we get to the next one, you'll see that a 70 degree speaker can still cover this whole shape. Um, it, you know, you start to get a different look. And this will also um, be, look at how different what the, this overhead has to, wants to cover the room from this direction. And this overhead is covering a different shape. So we have a, um, like an X20 that is 110 by 110. That's really sweet from the corner. And the 110 by 50 is really sweet from the side. So you have to think about these kind of things and what's the best solution. Well, take a look, try them out. We'll uh, load up some files in a little while and I'll start shooting some pictures for you and you'll see which ones give you some better results. The other thing to note is that the height of the speakers becomes more and more important as we get more asymmetrical. Remember I told you about I liked a, a full 1G height for the laterals. If you are at a half G height and you are having to face all the way down this room, you'll never get there. You're just, it's not going to happen. And in, in addition, you want to have a speaker that is more asymmetric. And what I mean by that is that if you look at a a speaker that's 90 by 90 in its coverage, well, that's very symmetric, but a speaker that's 110 by 50 is much more asymmetric, and a speaker that's 110 by 12 is even more asymmetric. So as you get yourself low into a long room, you're going to need an asymmetric solution because that's the only thing that can get over the heads of the people close and make any kind of penetration deep. So now I'm to the maximum room I'm going to show you, which is 40 by 20 meters. So it's a two to one ratio uh, in the room. And that makes it a three to one ratio in my inner rectangle go zone. And you can see just how dramatically different what we are facing on the ends and the sides. So it's a, it's a huge difference in shape that we need to hit. That's going to make it more and more challenging. So I just tell you straight out. If you want a full planetarium experience, a totally 100% symmetrically mappable system, get yourself a planetarium. Get yourself a square room or a circular room or a, or a dome, and that's the great shape if you want perfect star mapping. But we don't design rooms. We don't uh, decide what rooms are or we're going to use because that's all done by promoters and architects. Um, okay. So that's kind of your overview there. And this is simply uh, put that increased rectangularity makes it more difficult. And as the rectangularity rises, we need to keep the height up and we need to uh, increase the asymmetry. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of what happens with the coverage as we go through these shapes. So this is the 25 by 20 room. That's the very mildly asymmetric and I'm using a 110 by 110 speaker, and I'm at the high position, so I'm a full go position. And this is now that same speaker trying to cover this 40 by 20 shape, which you can see 
it's doing its best, but there's only so much of that speaker that it can spread. And now just a note about my scale. You notice it's just three colors, uh, red, blue, and black. Everything in red is inside of the zero to six dB range. And I call this, this is the basic coverage pass fail test. If I'm within six dB, I check that off as good. Now this is not 12 dB down, of course, this is 7 dB down, 8, 9, 10, 11, but eventually there you go to 12. And when you hit the blue black border, you've gone 12 dB down. And when you hit the blue black border, I think we can pretty well say she's dead, Jim. It's, it's over. You can't be successfully mapping things with somebody's 12 dB down because, of course, the low end won't be 12 dB down. It just means it's dark, it's, it's uh, indistinct, and it's not loud. So this it shows you the more asymmetric room, it's simply the facts of life that we're going to have uh, less of the room into a full immersion. On that, it yes, should sir. be said that full immersion, you could easily make a space map and add a couple more of those lateral speakers on that side to get full coverage of the room. This is a granular immersion that you're talking about. So if one speaker hitting the whole room, but you could easily build a space map that adds a couple of those lateral speakers in to where anytime you move to the left side of the map or the south side of the map, it um, it hits and activates multiple speakers to, to cover everything so that you localize to the wall, just not necessarily at the same place wherever you're sitting. So, so if I'm hearing Josh correctly, if this is at full zero dB, this could come in at some smaller number of dB and start to expand the red zone, pushing it out there. It's essentially a widened guy. You don't, you don't, you're not going to put these guys all up at zero because then you're just going to end up with a combed out mess. But if these guys are brought in at lower levels, they can build on this and expand the image without taking down the ship. Yeah. And you can use a virtual node or derived node to do that. And we, we can show some examples once we get into rooms. So then here we are fighting from the corner. You can see that from this mildly asymmetric room, I'm able to do a very good, reasonable job. And then you're getting less of it. And I could use some help as we get deep into the room on this one. You know, if, if you really have a highly asymmetric room and you're, you've got the budget and the, and the wherewithal, you can basically add turbo boosters in the middle that are going to essentially act as mappable delay so that when it's here, you would add this speaker in, and then when it was mapped to here, you would add it into this one and send it that way. Would that be a, a, an approach that you would do, Josh? Uh, yeah, absolutely, if you want. <laughs> Again, uh, with this, the abstraction that SpaceMap provides, you can connect multiple output nodes to the same output and really get some interesting results. All right, but so if you had a center, a little center cluster, a little booster center cluster that was 360 degrees, then it can be brought in when needed to extend the coverage and send it yep. send it into the corners and and that keeps it localized. It's the thing that you don't want you don't want to turn this speaker on while this is on to to make this red because yes you're getting coverage but now you're into something that's not localizing in the correct yep. direction. So I don't want just coverage. I want it to be coverage. I want to make a statement: is I'm over here. I'm talking to you. OK, so if I'm located here, I can continue that journey. Yeah. And using a derived node for that is totally possible. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, again, as we go into these larger examples where we start needing fills, derived nodes will start coming into play. Anytime a main speaker receives its information, the derived node would get the same information. So this is how we deal with overcoming architectural challenges in a lot of ways. Exactly. Okay, so here we are now. You're, you can see the challenge of being straight on the, the long end, and you can see again that that center uh, turbo charge would be the way to go forward and extend that room. Another way to do it, and it might seem silly, but believe it or not, uh, a speaker like a Lena or a Leopard here, which is you know super asymmetric, that can go deeper because it's got you know 12, 8, 10, 15 degrees of vertical coverage. Um, so that gets you deeper than this 50 degree coverage um, by going over uh, the close people's heads. This is what happens now if you go low. I'm showing you a low position 
and you can see the trouble that you get into. Low position, now you're just stuck, stuck in the mud. Once you're stuck low, you've got to fight with extreme asymmetry, and that's where you're going to use what normally would be line array type products like a Lena or a Leopard if you have no choice and you're stuck low and you want to succeed and or you're going to looking at uh, booster uh, as you go here. We're in the overheads now. So I've moved to the overhead speakers. There we are. This is using the 110 by 110 because it's really sweet. Um, a round speaker in this nearly square room does a super great job. And here it is again, uh, going from this corner, it's doing a fine job going this way. This is now using the X40, which is the 110 by 50. And what's interesting about it is see, it really actually spreads a lot more in this case, because 50 degrees this way allows me to get much deeper. See what happens there? Remember that everything that you see in here is relative. It takes the loudest spot and starts that at zero and calls it 6 dB. So that's the relative measure that we're using. So it might be surprising to see that, you know, an asymmetric speaker is the better choice here, but you're in an asymmetric location here. And this is much more of a symmetric location. There's the 110 by 50, the X40, which does sweet from going sideways and also really sweet from that corner. Trapezoids are the next shape to think about. It's a very um, common shape that we have a, a room skinnier at the front, or maybe you have a proscenium stage, so the room gets skinnier. And so when you think about this trapezoid, you're looking at essentially that rectangular shape, but it has moved its way inward. So what are we going to do? Well, we're still going to keep the same basic go zone shape, but it's just going to get pinched down here because the room is pinching down here. And where are we going to place the lateral? If we can't place them out here, we're going to place them where the real wall is. So they come in, but they essentially are going to maintain that spacing and they're going to maintain that aim into the room. Similarly, I'm not going to move the overheads a whole lot. They're just going to be moved slightly inward to create this. And this is a very mild trapezoid, but it's not, it's pretty fairly common shape in our industry. Let's just increase the trapezoidality. That's a real fancy word there. And so what we've done is we've increased the place to where one half of the room is now in the wedge part. And I'm still, since it's the midpoint in the room, I'm still the same go factor. There it is. The five meters is still the thing. But what you can see now is I'm bringing in this quite a bit. And now it's really coming quite close to the mains there. So that spacing is closer than anything that we've got. In fact, it's kind of close to the main to main spacing. Any more than that, I would be troubled by that. But I could conceivably push this out a little bit and then proportionally decrease everybody else's spacing. This is not close enough that I'm uncomfortable. It kind of just links it nicely to the mains and extends it out makes a soft start to the spatialization, which isn't a bad thing because one of the hardest transitions you're going to have is the mains to the first surround in terms of hiding transitions. So it's not bad to make that a, a short step. Okay, we're getting even more trappy. In fact, the entire room is a wedge horn and we are still 10 meters at the midpoint. And so we still would have the same go factor and we're, here we are with the spacing. And this is getting quite short here. And I could proportionally squeeze these guys a little bit, or like I could just discuss for all the same reasons there. Now, what you notice, this gets interesting on the trapezoidal uh, shape of the overheads. You can see I've realigned things. I've just got one up here because I don't have two Gs across. If I place them two G spacing, I'd be way out here and way out here. I don't want to get in this guy's face. So this works here, and now I end up with three across here, and we're ending up with, a, I think it's about an eight meter spacing. So it's 1.8 or 1.6 Gs instead of a two G spacing. So I'm a little bit closer, but that's because it's an odd number, and I don't want to fall short and have them over the two G spacing because uh, they're at the two G height. You know, you could accommodate a slightly lower elevation with this spacing, 
or you could keep this and get yourself a little more immersion. And that's the story there. But you also notice that we had to add speakers on the rear surrounds. We've been, we've been sitting at three rear surrounds for a long time. Now we're up to five because we have widened the room. It was, you know, it's the same 20 meters across here, but it is now 30 something on the backside. We've got five, 10, 15, 20, 24, um, 28. I think that's about what I've got. So I work this to get this to be a quite smooth movement so that there's not a big difference in spacing between those guys. So that's, that's how to approach a trapezoid room. You basically have to expand your rears and you have to accommodate the movement of the walls in the front. Now, what about a fan-shaped room? So here it is. There's our arkish and making a quasi-fan shape. And you can see this is not very different from the trapezoid that we just did. Oh, on the overheads, it's got just one in the front and three on the back. So you're creating um, a similar shape. You're just bulging this thing more as you go. And we're quite close here. We could stand to move this in and tighten the sky up a little bit. What I'm going to do is just keep widening the fan. I just keep pushing it out. And what you see is I'm now having to stretch these guys more. But you see, I work to keep this a very even spacing on the overheads so that I can still fly my helicopter around and not get bunched up anywhere. And I've got a very even spacing all around the perimeter. You're increasing this fan even more. And you can see that we are now reached a stretching point beyond where if I don't have a center speaker, I've got way too much distance. So this is now where I can, I'm can i going beyond the virtual node. I'm going to have to put a real center speaker in there because I simply got too much real estate. But with that, everybody is almost the same distance. So I can fly around this way and keep that same spacing. And I can fly across this way and keep a similar spacing. I'll show you this. You'll see this speaker. It's just, it's just quite amazing. Center speakers, they just have a hard time. And I actually rose this one up a little higher to keep it on the planetarium dome to give it more of a chance. If you keep this at the same height, it's amazing how little of a piece of real estate you are given when you have that. So what did I have to do? I had to add more of these guys. I'm up to nine on my rear and one, two, three, four on the sides. Um, so you can see we're, we're, we're reshaping as we go. But we're keeping the spacing is staying constant, allowing us to basically keep the same amount of the room as my design area of my go perimeter. A person here would see this speaker if it's in the high position at 45 degrees, and anybody here sees that speaker at less than 45, less than 45, less than So it's very much a lateral to almost this entire trajectory. And that's the, the basic idea. And then from here, we go over to map 3D. This is a in the round application. This is taking everything that we've learned and saying, what about if we did something really crazy and that was we want a full in the round experience? Well, what are we doing here? For an in the round experience, I need to think I should turn on my mains. Okay. So I'm going to give left and right. I'll, I'll go ahead and zoom in for the, to see one of the quadrants. Okay. And everybody gets a left and right. There's no, center in this particular case and don't worry about this speaker that speaker i just used for planning purposes so left and right and then well, we start with our laterals and they start moving up the side and then they it's 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 kind of a it's even though there's no audience here we have to take a a sort of a fan approach and so then we're fanning across and so you're seeing that fan-shaped trajectory that we that we saw before. And then, okay, and everybody goes through this magic spot. If I just take a picture of one of these guys, you can see what it can do. 
And of course, this is much more real. I have a raked audience. Everybody isn't flat on the ground anymore. And the winner is boom. Okay. So I've got, uh, th these are, these are VOMs. This is a projection area of the VOM. It's not relevant. It's uh, relevant to the audience. It's actually only relevant to the actors coming in and out of this show. But you can see we covered almost this entire area, a very happy outcome. I'm going to go to an isometric view so you can see a little more of what we're talking about. So you can see we've got rear surrounds here, side surrounds, everybody's coming in. And now these rear surrounds are up against a bit of a challenge. Anytime that the audience goes up, now your speakers need to go up and you're going to want to try to make it so that you don't go so high that you're perceived as overhead to everybody, but you got to be high enough to not burn up the people in those first seats. And that is a pretty darn good shot, I'd say. That's one speaker. So that's amazing coverage for one speaker. Not to say that you couldn't add like a lower fill or a delay fill to delay back to that, to get those last seats up the front popped back in. Yes, for sure. Because as you can see, they've hardly bought any speakers at all. When we say we need more, they're just going to be like, oh yeah, no Or we problem. could pull a love and put speakers in the seats. <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> so I've got some other projects. I'm going to pull up one of these trapezoids and these fans. Well, while you're doing that, Bob, I'm seeing a beginning to see a pattern here. Coming from the Constellation team, I'm used to this, is we build a shell of speakers around. And what you're using mm -hmm. with the guidelines are just guidelines for placement so that you have as much even coverage and the, the handover between each element is as smooth as possible. And yes. when, when you, you have to make compromises at that point, you can utilize the tools within Space Map to sort of overcome some of those architectural challenges. And we live in the real world, and we are always constantly having conversations with designers, building owners, architects, and consultants about where we can, and, and lighting designers, about where we can and cannot put speakers. And uh, what's yes. cool is this combination of, okay, here's the perfect shell that we can make, but also we can utilize some of the tools within Space Map Go to overcome these, these compromises that, that have to happen in our industry. So this is the ideal, but uh, as you said, you know, not, not everyone will have the budget for this. And we're going to cover talk about that more next week about how to deal with overcoming these challenges. Luckily, we have these example venues where people have done something like this. So this is um, really exciting. Okay, I'm going to actually going to do another in the round of another venue. And this one is kind of fun because it had to make real compromises. So we're going to show you now a little version of what if you're going to go and uh, Rolling Stones this thing and you can't always get what you want. And so I'm going to pull that up. In this case, you've got a couple of challenges. Number one, you don't have enough speakers. They had a fixed number of speakers in the budget. And so we don't have enough speakers. The next part is that you had too low of a ceiling. So we can't get up as high as we would ideally like to go. And so what you're going to see is the limits of effectivity and the things that you're going to do to maximize based on all the principles that we implement when we have full control. And what do we do when we don't have full control? So here's your, your basic story here. You have a mains and they had 10 main speakers. Of course, we wanted left, center, right for all, but we were short these. They really needed 12. We had 10. So to in order to make sure everybody gets left and right, I made a left and right and a derived center for these ones and left, center, and right for these. What you're going to do is you're going to make one map that fits north, east, west, and south, but this one will go with a derived center and this one will go with an actual center. And then because the ceiling was low, I placed my overheads and it really, most everybody, you see, I placed them in gaps so that I could get the most spread on them by, you know, the hottest part is of course always on axis, but I could get the most spread out of these guys by putting them in the gaps. And, and you have one um, extra layer turned on, which is the overhead inner 
the yellow because you had two positions for the overheads. Oh, okay. Yes, I'll turn that off. Thank you. And I also have space maps for this that we can compare uh, to. Okay. So you can see I'm not covering the whole room uh, or even the whole area. You know, I had to inform the people that basically in this case, you're more looking like a cinematic level of surround capability uh, for the overheads. So if I turn on all of these, so you had to scale back and say, okay, you're going to get a quasi planetarium. You don't, you're not going to be able to get, you know, the helicopter is going to lift up, but it's not going to circle the room. Yeah, the way I think about it, Bob, is how much granularity do you as the sound designer need versus how much the room dictates? Sometimes the room will not allow you, especially in the round, which is I think we can all agree is one of the hardest from a sound perspective to cover everyone. In the round adds this complexity. So as so you add elements, you get less granularity, but you get better coverage and you can easily design a map to cover that. And um, I've got a different color scheme. I'm using a 3DB color scheme. If I go to the 6DB that we've been seeing, okay, so we've got, you know, most of it um, is done. And then um, these guys would pick up some overhead because the very highest back seats are going to pick up overhead by these. Because remember that when you're in the back row, this is perceived as high above you. That's the nature of the of the beast. So we're going to get everybody is going to be able to get a vertical lift. So, Josh, do you want to show the, the space map for this one? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about this from a design perspective. So here we have that map that Bob was just showing. This is a real world room. And when I'm thinking about designing a space map for easy control, I want to use the system in multiple ways. The first way I would want is to have a very granular system to where if I move my finger around the space map, if I put it here, it will only be out of this top speaker. Um, if I put it in the center speaker here, it will only be out of this center and not others. And so that is completely possible. And that's a good map for sound designers, especially when they want to move sound effects throughout the space. Or let's say you're mixing a live band in the round and you want just like some instruments or the symbols to move around the space. So what you can do actually with Space Map Go is make a space map and sort of divide the room up into zones. And so the way I think about it is I look at one zone and I say, okay, what speakers are used in this zone? And this works especially well for in the round. And I can see that we have an exact copy on the other side. So if we called this North, South, East, and West, um, we can see that we have a couple challenges in this room. The first is that the East and West do not have a real center and that there's two less speakers on the edges for this section, the East and West section. So you have this overhead here, which might cover a little bit of these guys and this overhead here that might cover a little bit here. But if we look at this section, we have an outer and inner and outer and inner overhead, and then an outer and inner and out inner and outer rear surround, whereas we only have two on each side. Here would be that same room in the round. Let's say this is north, this is south, this is east, and this is west. And so using this space map, I added a virtual node to where now, if I have my position located center, we can see that we have weighted distribution of the audio amongst all of these channels that we see here. And if I wanted to carry it out and just move to the east side, I can do that very quickly. And now we have a granular space map to where if I need a sound effect to just go around the lateral walls, I could use it. Um, I could also use this space map to just sort of hit the overheads. You'll notice I put a whole bunch of virtual nodes in the place. And so if I'm over a virtual node, we can see that we have sort of equal power. And so this would help for the transition from the stage in the center of the room to get to the overheads, then to get into the rear. So if I needed to do something to where I had a sound come from stage and localize here, I could easily do that. And so a granular space map's great, but when I have speakers here that are on, these people won't hear that. And so there's a use case for this. It's probably a more theatrical use case. But in a live environment, when I'm mixing a band, I need to think about this room in a different way. And so this is where that zoned approach comes in. 
using a series of derived nodes. So what I did was took one section of speakers. I took the north section of speakers. And in this side, we have a north uh, center. We have, uh, I'm sorry, we have the left, then we have the center, and then we have the right speaker. These are actual speaker nodes. And then we have the overhead left outer, overhead left inner, overhead right inner, and then overhead right outer. And then we also have the rear surround outer, rear surround inner, rear surround uh, right outer, uh, I'm sorry, inner and rear surround uh, outer. So that's great. And that would easily handle that section. But what about the other three sections of speakers? Well, I can use derived nodes for those. So we can take each section of speakers and add them and use derived nodes. Remember, derived nodes are absolute power. So now, uh, if we just look at our main left here, I know that for my other three zones, my uh, south, east, and west zone, I need to link. So quite simply, all I do is set add a derived node and then just link it to the output wherever it corresponded to. But my east and my west sections on the space map do not have a center speaker. So what I can actually do is use two more instances of derived nodes, and I can actually set the output to the same output that I would use for my left uh, on one side. And so you'll notice that my center speaker has five derived nodes. And you'll notice that you I trimmed out the derived node by six dB. To do dB math, uh, negative six plus negative six, zero. So that's how we can create a phantom center for our east and west, is basically we have an east what, left and east right, and then we have a west left and a west right, and they're set via the app, via derived nodes at six dB. The same is true for our overheads, where we could sort of tie in a couple of the other overheads for our smaller sections. Now we can have a space map to where the front I can use for traditional left center right mixing. And that way, anytime I'm on here, it's always in the right section of speakers. If I put it in the top corner, we'll see, we can see here that all of the, the matrix levels for these sections, north, south, east, and west are getting the same level. So every time I'm on the right side of the map, I know the whole entire right main right room in 360 degrees, it's coming out of the right speaker for that zone section. And the same thing is true for the left. Here we have an in the round in the left, and we can see now on our labels that uh, east, west, left, main are activated within the matrix. The south, left is activated within the matrix and the north left is activated in the matrix. So now I can use the space map to do the granular things I want to do. So if I needed a sound to go throughout the walls of the room, I could do that. If I just wanted to mix left center right, like a frontal system, I could do that. And if I wanted to just go into the overheads, I could do that as well. And so using virtual nodes to tie things together, I can also create sort of quadrants and activate the rear wall and the overheads and then the frontal system. And then I can go front to back in the sound. I'm in the back of the wall of the whole entire room. I'm in the overheads and now I'm in just left center right speakers. So this is the space map presented in two separate ways. It doesn't look like this. It's not as chaotic and it's not as granular, but it allows for easy control of a system. Bob, back to you. I have got another hall, another design in the very same room, and that's the, this is an interesting application because it's the same set of speakers in the same room, but it's reconfigured to an end stage configuration. So here are my my main speakers, and like I said, there's five mains across. It's the same room. You can see the go zone is this is this square in here. And then there's the seating. I'm going to turn the go zone or flash the go zone for you. It's right there. Okay. There's your go zone. The idea is that each of the mains is, is done in that traditional way that, that uh, I've shown you before. Everybody is pointed inward. And we have this guy is going to cover a large amount of the room. They just don't quite make it up 
to the very top. And that's where this delay speaker is going to come in. And I've got a, a delay speaker to supplement those. Now, that delay can be fed the center channel and timed accordingly. It can be fed um, the, the left channel, the right channel, whichever ones um, through the delay matrix in order to supplement each of the channels as needed. So with an appropriate amount of level and delay. So here you can see what is right center. Um, I'm on a 3 dB color thing. So you can see I've got my zero to 3 dB range covering a big part of the room. And then the, the last six are up there. So those delays don't need to do much, which is sweet because that means uh, the less of those you need, the more easy it's going to be for, for you to maintain the full localization. Because let's face it, these things don't help. Uh, if you can do it unassisted, that's great. If you do it a little assistance, that's good too. You can see I've got some low frequency surround, just like we talked about before. So there's my front surround. There's my rear. Here are the side surrounds. And here are the overheads. The overheads are in a much better capability now to get a large amount of the room. I'm going to shoot one of these guys. So. Uh, basically, it's the same number of speakers that I had to do in the round. I can do a lot more detail and more granularity when I'm not in the round. When I've got to make one circle, I can you know, use those resources much better than if I have to make four circles. Still, the ceiling is low. I've got 3 dB. I've got 6 dB. Um, not able to get everybody in like in the ideal world. And there's your side surround. You know, this is where the rubber hits the road, as they say. You know, it's great to see the idealized design, what you can do when you have all the full control. And then, eh, you know, it's like you, then you can see what you have. You know, I'm able to get at least, I, I've, um, I'm, I got half the room, more than half the room. I'm already through with the front and made it to, so I'm really a good two thirds of the room that I made it inside of the 60V window. And so here we have that room. The way I like to design a room is, of course, when I'm designing a space map, is I like to have my stage really at the top of the space map. So in map, I just flipped it over and I sort of look at a top down view of this room. And this will sort of dictate how you design a space map. I know I can get granular control because Bob has designed a sound system that has almost everyone in coverage. And so I can add granular maps, but I can also do maps for more broader strokes of sound. When I work in design rooms in space map, the first space map I make is a visual representation of the room as much as possible. And so here is that exact room uh, that we were just showing represented in space map. And what you have is a left, um, uh, you know, that frontal system is right here. Here's the subwoofer from that system represented as a derived node. And then Bob also mentioned that we had three delay speakers in that room. And so what I'm using for those delay speakers is just derived nodes. I, you can see I link them to the two closest speakers. If this delay was covering part of a room and it needed to just be a mono mix down because of what, for whatever reason, the coverage area that this covered wasn't getting any of these other speakers, I could simply just tap and add these other five frontal speakers in here, anytime audio played out of one of these speakers, it would always arrive at that delay speaker. But in this case, just have a simple derived node for the closest two. I did that. And then we move on here to where we have the center. And with the center one, I did three. And then with the right one, I did two. And then you'll put a whole bunch of virtual nodes in. And these virtual nodes are literally just anchor points for trisets. Uh, we can see here that we have a subwoofer that's handling the low frequency energy for these speakers. And here's the subwoofer for this side. Here's our overhead system. And as we use it, this is a very granular space map so that the sound designer or the live mix engineer, when he's mixing the band, could easily just implement this and move sound in a granular way across the space. But since space map can do so much more than that, one thing that I like to do is have reverbs. And so what I did was take that same map and just took out all of the overhead speakers and made a lateral system. And instead of connecting the trisets 
to the actual outputs of the speakers. I connected the tri sets to virtual nodes, and I also linked the virtual nodes. So if we look here at this virtual node, we can see that this virtual node is connected to these four speakers. That means that any time my, my finger or uh, touches this virtual node, we have evenly weighted distribution of those four speakers. So effectively, I can make a quad map. So right here would be the right corner of the room. Here would be the left corner of the room, back left, front left, center. And then I also use the virtual node in the center to activate all of the speakers. So this is useful for things like reverb. I do I use this a lot for reverbs. And um, I'll have a stereo reverb, or maybe I'll have a 5.1 reverb on each one of my channels within space map in my mix, I can just add that space map back in and put each channel and just set it statically. And anytime my reverb comes out, it will always hit on these speakers here. That's a great use case, but there's so much more than that. So let's say I want to do a frontal system to where I need my actor as they're moving across the proscenium to mix in and out. I can do that here and have my band do what, what's hot in the industry. And I can do a frontal system like this. But at the same time, I can still utilize this quad map that I made and basically send sound to chunks of the system or if I want to send it to all. So this is useful for mono reverbs as well. Let's say I have my favorite mono reverb and I want to limit my channel count out of my console. I can use that mono reverb and very easily with the touch of a finger send that mono reverb to all speakers. That's the power of a virtual node. So these virtual nodes come together and do some really amazing things. But using that same virtual node setup, I made an additive space map for this room. Uh, and so we've talked about additive space maps, but you can see basically up here, we notice that we're just hitting some speakers here. And then as I move down, we start adding speakers. And the, the SPL energy evenly distributes itself amongst the system. So with the touch of a finger, I can have, if I go to the right-hand corner, I can have the left side of the room completely on. If I go to the uh, right-hand corner, I can have the right side of the room completely on. And if I go to the uh, center of the room down here, I can have the whole entire room on. Or if I wanna just have the front section of the room on, I could do move it up. Let me make this easier to look at. So within Space Map, you can also okay. disable things. So I'm looking at green balls, and I should be looking at white halos. Is that what I'm being told? Yeah. Uh, the, yes, because the the okay. green balls, the green octagons are derived nodes. So because they're delay speakers, they're always going to have some sort of audio level in them. But the actual other speakers here, uh, the speaker nodes which we can see that this is a subwoofer connected here linked to these speaker nodes. Okay. We can see that as we go up and down the map, notice the matrix also starts adding speakers. Mm -hmm. So if I mm -hmm. take away, yes, if I, I add, I it spills it. No, out. I'm sorry. I, I no was worries. looking at the, not looking for, for white fuzzy. I was looking for, I was expecting the green to, to, to turn off and turn on, but okay. Yeah. And so with this map, we have a, a stereo space map that is activating the whole entire room in a much more broad level um, than a granular level. And so the, I use this for stereo reverbs all the time. And what I'll do is I'll just, um, let's take channel five here. I'll add it to uh, this channel and I'll use, this will be my left reverb coming in on channel one here. And then I'll take channel six select the space map, add that same space map back in. It could be a different space map if I wanted to, and I'll put, I'll put it here. So if this were a reverb coming in, a uh, stereo, this channel would be left of the reverb. This would be activating the right side of the room. If this were a drum mix, this would be, or a keyboard, this would be keyboard left, this would be keyboard right, and keyboard left and right are now in the whole entire room. And if I link my channels, Let's do mirror X. Now I can link them together. Uh, and let's say we want left to be right and right to be left. Well, oh, there we go. <laughs> and very simply, I can control how the room behaves on a much more 
uh, robust level than your typical object-based mixing. It's hard to explain and hard to visualize, especially when you add this abstraction, but this is the power of space map in that using virtual nodes and derived nodes, we can control systems in a much more simple way, but do much more complex moves. And then of course, if we wanted to move that around, we could add a trajectory and just have it, you know, do things for us. Um, so there you go. Next week, we're going to be talking about uh, expanding this even further. We raked audience um, and balconies, and uh, and then we're going to go to um, arenas and, uh, you know, large scale. We're just going to basically, it's really going to be all about, we're, we're pretty much done with the theoretical. We're just going to do venues. Um, and, of course, you'll run into rake, uh, how to deal with rakes in the venues because uh, they're pretty popular. <laughs> People like to see the stage. Um, Bob, thank you, as always, for um, blowing you, our minds with thank system you, design. And thank you, my fellow panelists. And uh, we'll see you later.